Hi, this is Rob Kelly, and uh, this is another very brief PowerPoint uh, video. This one is all about how do we actually create phobias and anxieties? How do we create them? How come some people have them and some people don't? How come some people can go through traumatic experiences and be unaffected while others seem to pick up phobias and fears, you know, depending on which way the wind blows? So, a question I quite often ask my clients is to gauge how internally they're thinking about their particular phobia or anxiety, if that's what they're consulting for. I say to them, OK, imagine you're 50 years old and imagine you've had a pathological phobia of dogs ever since you were 10. That's for 40 years. At age 10, you were rather savagely bitten by a dog and you've even got the scars down your right leg to prove it. Ever since age 10, you've had this huge fear of dogs. Whenever you've seen a dog, you've had a panic attack. You've kept away from them. That You've thought of them as frightening. Age 50, why is it you still have a phobia of dogs? And then I leave them to answer. And 99 times out of 100, they're going to answer in a very external way, obviously. And they're going to say something like, well, the memory was so traumatic, it stayed with me all this time. Or they say, I get these flashbacks, or just to hear a dog bark, and I get these immediate flashbacks, and the memory comes flooding to the surface, or the emotions come flooding to the surface, and immediately I'm remembering, I've got this vision in my mind of this thing happening to me, and it's awful, and it's terrifying, and it's horrible. And of course that's not true, but this is the way they think about it. And of course, if they think that way about it, then it's going to stay with them, because that's a very powerful belief. So let's have a look about how we really do create phobias and anxieties. And really you want to watch this video in conjunction with some of the other recent videos like the, the um, balloons and the one about it's not about the past. So if you look at the top of the page and let's say someone has an experience. Now this experience can just be a thought, it can be something that they're reading a book, something they watched on telly, could be an experience of their own, they might be bitten by a dog, they might be told a story about someone else being bitten by a dog, they might hear a dog barking, they might watch a horror film, they might just have a bad dream. But for whatever reason, they're having an experience, something to do with dogs, for example. And if you look down the left-hand side of the picture as you're looking at it, so a person with an internal locus of control, well, of course, a person with an internal locus of control is going to experience that experience in a completely different way to someone who's external, aren't they? The whole experience of it is going to be much less emotional, much more in control, much less catastrophic, with much better perspective. But let's just say, for sake of argument then, uh, for this demonstration, the internal person and the external person both experience it in exactly the same way. So on this occasion, a person with an internal locus of control is going to process the experience in a powerful way. So they've just been through this trauma, they've been bitten by a dog. How are they likely to be reacting? Well, they're likely to be reacting in a, a very relieved way, aren't they? They're going to be feeling good, they're going to be feeling powerful in that they've escaped this thing. They're unlikely to be catastrophizing the whole event. They're more likely to be seeing it in a very positive light, as in a kind of dodge that bullet. They're unlikely to be thinking, oh my God, all dogs are scary, that was terrifying, this is awful, or anything like that. They're likely to have a very positive adaptation from that. That was okay, that was a scary thing, I got through it, it's all alright now. Calming themselves down, sorting out their cuts and bruises, and they'll probably never ever worry about that again. They'll probably never ever revisit that experience, because they don't consider it a hugely traumatic thing. It's one of those things that we go through in life. You get on with life, you get over it, you move on. It's unlikely that that experience will ever be revisited or will ever need to be revisited. But what happens though if a person processes it in an external way, an external or powerless way? The whole thing is going to be thought of as highly traumatic, as life-threatening, as hugely catastrophic, as awful. They're going to feel completely powerless. They're going to feel um, terribly frightened and anxious about this whole thing. Catastrophizing not just the event of what's happening now. They probably believe they're going to bleed to death or get some kind of infection because they're bitten by this dog or scared by this dog. So they create, or later on they maintain, 
unhelpful beliefs about the experience. Thinking about it in a certain way, it's scary. They might just have the, the, the idea in the mind that dogs are scary, dogs are frightening, dogs are awful. So then they create anticipatory anxiety about dogs in the future. Don't forget, if they've got an external locus of control, they're very likely to have very poor secondary control. And secondary control, of course, is all about managing your emotions. Do I think I can manage my emotions about being bitten in the past? Do I think I can manage my emotions about potentially being bitten in the future? No, I can't. This is terrifying. It's devastating. So they're exercising their primary control. Got to keep away from dogs. Dogs are scary. Got to keep away. Also going to exercise a high desire for control because that's the only thing they can use to protect themselves. So these things then promote the engagement in pro-belief thinking and behaviour. If you go back to our discussions a few years back, those of you that were around, still on the forum, still on the, uh, the portal in terms of CPI, um, for a cycle of dysfunctional behaviour, pro-belief thinking is thinking that legitimises and normalises the thought. So this person is likely then to think a whole stream of different things about dogs. Dogs are scary. Dogs are frightening. Dogs are unpredictable. Dogs are terrifying. Got to keep away from dogs. Got to avoid dogs. Don't let the children near dogs. Don't live near dogs. Dogs are awful. It's terrifying. There's nothing you can do. They really hurt. They could end your life. It's awful. It's terrifying. And this, of course, then feeds back into their main beliefs about their prior experience. So this then becomes a little cycle of behaviour. You can see it there, bottom right hand corner. This is a cycle of behaviour feeding into itself. Each part of that cycle feeds into another part of the cycle and just keeps going round and round and round. Think of the balloons, of course, and the balloons here would be the engagement in probably thinking. Every time they think about it, they're blowing a little bit more air back into that balloon, keeping this whole fear alive. And of course, this cycle can become so quick that it becomes just habitual. And a person can say to you, well, Rob, I didn't even think about it. Honestly, I just heard a dog bark and before I even knew it, I'm having a panic attack. And they use that as a way of kind of saying to you, it's unconscious, it's beyond their control. But of course, that's not true. What happened was it was just a very, very quick reaction. But they only reacted in that way because they believed dogs to be frightening. If you believe dogs to be frightening and scary, then hearing a dog bark in close, in close proximity, it's likely to arouse anxiety, isn't it? Get the adrenaline pumping. But actually, if you love dogs and think that all dogs are lovely, hearing a dog bark is likely just to put a smile on your face as you look around for where this little pooch is. This cycle can become very, very quick, though, and that can add to a person feeling even more powerless about it. But of course, it's still conscious. It's still in their mind. It's still something they can change. Now, just talking about dogs here, but this can be a phobia or a fear of anything at all. We know it doesn't have to be about an event. We know from previous discussions and from previous prior research we've looked at, again, particularly around things like dogs flying and emetophobia, that a person's autobiographical memory, their real memories of an event, don't ever match up to how much they fear it. The two things are completely unlinked. We know that Irish people are just as likely to have a fear of snakes as an English person, and yet they've probably never seen a snake because there's no snakes in Ireland. You don't need to have a traumatic event to create a phobia. It can just be a thought or a dream. A lot of emetophobes don't ever remember being sick. It doesn't have to be that they've choked or gagged or been sick to cause their fear of being sick. We know it's about thinking styles. Equally, People can experience something incredibly traumatic and not turn it into a phobia or anxiety, particularly they're very internal and um, adapt it in, a, in a, having a very a, um, positive adaptation of that experience. So let's say now this is something more traumatic. Let's say somebody, it's a horrible thought, but let's say some uh, child is being abused, going through a, a series of abusive experiences. It would still be processed in exactly the same way. We know that resilient kids bounce back. They don't see it as traumatic. They don't see it as defining them. They see it as something that's made them stronger and they move on and they become more resilient from something like that. Other people, particularly if they've got a strong desire for control, may brood and worry about these things over a long period of time, creating even more anxiety. Still thinking that the past is so significant. 
these memories, these experiences, emotions from the past have still got a huge hold over me. They're still causing me to react in this way. That's just not true at all. It's their beliefs and their thinking styles in the present that promote and maintain these unhelpful beliefs that in turn promote and maintain phobias and anxieties. I hope you found this video helpful. Cheers.